Welcome to uh, How to Gain Social Media Followers 101, hosted by you, Imagine Center. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Chelsea. She's just going to give a quick introduction of who she is. Um, she, uh, I'll, just, I'll just introduce her a little bit. She graduated in 2016, and uh, she has been working, um, doing so digital social media stuff uh, across the entire country as she now lives in Utah and is uh, working for herself. So I'll just let her do it. So here's Chelsea, and she can uh, introduce herself. All right. Hey, everyone. Happy to be here. <laughs> My headshot from Christmas time. Uh, so yes, I graduated in 2016 on campus. Uh, I was involved in Phonathon. I was a part of File Alpha Psi. I uh, am, lived in Kegwin that I'm really excited to see the new building that has like Eaten <laughs> Kegwin, but anyway, uh, so uh, after school, I lived in Connecticut and worked in senior living and have since moved to Utah um, and had the opportunity to work with a really cool company where I worked with various HGTV celebrities and um, massive entrepreneurs. And since then, I have gone my own route and I do a lot of freelance work for econ for uh, service-based uh, clients and uh, education-based clients. So it's a little bit about me. Um, a lot of my focuses are Facebook ads, uh, copywriting, just overall strategy and kind of creative strategy. So I love what I do. Um, I work from my home. This is my kitchen. And uh, I have gone the freelance route and love it. Awesome. Thank you so much. So Chelsea's going to be here the entire night throughout the presentation. Um, she can interrupt me whenever she wants to. And I have two other guys here that are going to help us uh, lead this workshop. Um, and then if you have any questions, put them in the chat and uh, she'll help answer them and we can answer them as well. So we're going to get things started. Can you get a quick to the bottom left? Okay. All right. So what to expect from tonight? We're going to talk about brand development. Then we're going to move on to target audience. And then we're going to talk about creating consistent content. Then we're gonna talk about engaging with your followers and we're gonna get into a little bit of how you're gonna make money. So let's get into brand development. These are some social media basics to help get things started. So brand development, there's three main things to brand development that help you define what your product or what you're selling is. Cause people follow you because you have something that they wanna see. So you gotta answer these three main questions. What is your product slash service? Why do people want your product slash service? And what advantage does your product have over other people's product? Once you answer those questions, it helps you understand what your service is. And now you need to create an identity for your company or product. Then that's your visual appeal. That's your logo, your colors, everything that involves around your visual appeal of your company. And then visual consistency helps you develop that brand. Many of the biggest companies out there have a visual consistency across all platforms and you, can know, you know what company it is based on the brand content that you see. So that's your first main step to help develop your brand. All right, I'm gonna bring over uh, Jake here and he's gonna talk about target audiences. All right guys, so once you figure out what your product is, what you are going to be showing on your social media page, you need to identify your target, target audience. And by doing this, you need to ask yourself, who is going to view my products? Who, who is gonna view my social media page? Right. And these factors can include um, their, everybody's age, uh, location, where they live, their job, their income, how much they bring in, because that can truly affect who is going to view your page and who likes it or not, especially from a business standpoint. Um, now, once you have, I've, uh, once you've pinpointed like who these people are, you need to figure out what they need, what they, their needs of the audience. So to do this, you need to ask, what do they want that I have, or what problem do they have that I can solve? Um, and by doing so, you can really narrow it down to who you are trying to attract to your page. And even so, you could have multiple audiences and you can still have an attraction. And finally, once you have narrowed it down to your specific audiences, you can use that to identify what platform is best for your product or your social media page. Um, for example, 65% of Instagram users are listed as ages 18 to 35. So clearly that is catered to more the younger generation. Um, Likewise, Twitter, 67% uh, of their uh, users are between the ages of 18 to 40. Um, 
these platforms are really geared towards the millennials and the younger generations. However, on the other hand, for the older demographics, they have actually doubled their activity on Facebook in the past year. So they are really active on Facebook and sites like LinkedIn um, to really create that, uh, that community feel. Um, but overall, you're all going for one goal, and that's to create content that appeals to all audiences. And I'm going to hand it over to Joe Shapiro right now, who's going to talk about creating content. All right, so content and creating content. If you don't know where to start, which I know a lot of people don't, um, try to write down some goals for yourself. So think about what, your what you want your content to look like, what you want your audience to gain from your content, like Jake said. Um, and that way you can get into kind of scheduling out what you're going to post. And so in order to create consistent content, it's super important that you have a schedule of what you're going to post a calendar. Even if you have to add alerts, go for it. Um, and that way you have everything every day with a post that you're going to have on that day. And when I say every day, when you're starting, especially a business, it's super important that you get consistent posts out every day. It doesn't have to be necessarily a post on your feed. Uh, but even reposting stuff on your story and interacting with people um, in your space in order to build a following because when you are posting consistently, it allows for your audience to be able to have that dependence on you and, and come back to your page and expect something. Um, and and it's, it's really a great way um, to build an audience with that, with that consistent content. So once you have that calendar um, and once you have those alerts, um, you're good to go on, on posting stuff, posting content. You go, you're going to want to create your content ahead of time. You don't just want to be winging it. Um, you don't want that alert to go off and you are finding something to post. Um, you want to, you want to really have all of that planned out. Um, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel either when it comes to creating content or posting content, you can always go through your Instagram feed, find relevant stuff to your industry to repost save those links, save those posts into your library. And that way you can go ahead and repost on your story um, and really interact with your followers in that way. Now um, I'm going to show you guys a video um, from Gary V. You might've heard of him. He's a super successful um, business. Yeah, she's on the other side so, too. Uh, is a big social media presence. So here's some advice that he has um, for interacting with your followers and, and how to build a brand. So. I'm gonna play this quick video. It's a music major. Works. Yeah, There it is. It's just starting a show right now, or a blog, and you're trying to figure out how to get traffic, here is how you do it. Let me help you. Gary, but the big question is how much does it cost to do this and build your brand and build in the new social media world? And here's my answer, folks. Two cents. My two cents. That's what it cost me. Leaving comments on blogs, forums, and social networks that have to do with your subject matter. What people don't understand is how much work I put to even begin the process of being who I am today. 2007, 2011 is a long time ago for a lot of people. That year, I decided to go on Twitter search and anybody that talked about wine, I jumped in and talked to them. So I'm in Twitter search, right? So this is gonna work for all of you if you wanna build. So you just go to Columbia, Maryland, and right now it's gonna show you all the top photos and all the recent photos. What I did, but on Twitter, with the word Pinot Noir, is I literally, and look, Instagram's a little bit of a different, like the first photo is like a dude who's like looking real. So like, <laughs> I mean, you could, you could, like, and this, I'm not joking. I would literally go in here and be like swole. Now notice what I did. I didn't just say cool or a heart. I like looked at the picture. Right, right. That was a swole dude, swole. Like that was a Wegmans, I like that place. Or you could have said something about the oranges. The more you give an actual comment. In real context then more you'll actually get what you want, which is awareness with the hope that it leads to something that you want. I did what I just showed you for four hours, five hours, six hours a day on Twitter. If I was nobody, which is 99% of people now, I don't have a million followers. I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to build my dreams and aspirations. I'm literally doing what I just so showed you for 10 hours a day, six hours a day. This is your dollar 80, right? It's my dollar 80, right? leaving your two cents 90 times a day, dollar 80.
All right. So you saw him talk about all that time and all that energy that he put into social media. 10 hours a day is a lot. Okay. So obviously maybe not 10 hours a day in the comment section. I know everyone has other stuff to do, um, but it does take work. And I know everyone harps on hard work, hard work. Well, what does that mean? It means focus work. Working hard at something um, entails really focusing that work on, on what your goals are. So if you're posting comments, um, make sure they're relevant in your field and make sure that um, you're really trying to post comments that are relevant. Um, it also not only in your field, but to what the post is like Gary just said. So um, I'm almost done here. I just want to leave you guys with this. Your posts, not only are they going to be consistent, but you have to make sure that they're not repetitive. So you want to be posting different kinds of content. So across platforms, there's so many different things you can do. Um, Jake touched on Twitter a little bit. Twitter's great for interacting with people, especially with polls um, and, and really keeping uh, people engaged with you. And uh, not only that, you want to have your content elicit emotions in people. So not, not, not that you're sitting there screaming in the camera or anything like that, but you want to post things that either make people laugh, make people cry, get them excited, um, and, and really, really engaged with what you're trying to say. So that's all I have. And I'm going to turn it back over to Manny. All right. I'm going to slow things down here real quick. Um, I'm going to have Chelsea. Chelsea, do you have anything to say by what we've talked about so far? Um, just to tune in. No, it's going really great. I was just thinking about um, engagement and one platform in particular where I really feel like, of course, right, you want to figure out who your audience is and what platform you're trying to reach people. But LinkedIn has an incredible uh, way of reaching people and expanding your network. So just a pro tip that I do is, so I actively try to comment on other people's LinkedIn, right, posts because it will show up in their feed. And a little pro tip is not only do you comment, you at everyone who's commented on the post because not only will it show to the person who first published the post, it will now show up to everyone who you've tagged who's engaged with the other posts or the same post. So anyway, just a pro tip, but it's a great way to reach a lot of people and expand your network really quickly on LinkedIn. Awesome. Thank you. And if you're not following the You Imagine LinkedIn, go ahead over and follow it. Um, shameless quick plug. All right, so just a little bit about engagement. I mean, Joe just talked about it a little bit with engaging in a sense of trying to like reach new people. Um, but also a big thing about, about engagement with your own customers, your own followers, is, is three main things. So go back. Sure. Sorry about that. All right, so three main things with engagement. You have customer satisfaction, customer re retention, and customer recommendation. All these things lead back to sales. Whether you're selling a product at a restaurant, you're, se you're selling uh, food, or you're selling clothes, you still are making a sale somewhere. And that's the whole point of your social media. You're promoting your service. Um, your service could be promoting someone else's service too. That also is another social media um, as like a brand developer um, and a brand representer. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But customer satisfaction, it's a big thing. If your customers are happy, they, they continue liking your content, they continue buying your stuff. Customer retention, making sure your customers come back. That's a big thing. If you, if you get your customer for that one sale, but they don't come back by your next product, you lost the customer. Um, and then customer recommendation. Um, a lot of companies will help promote people that are promoting them. So especially on Instagram, I know, if you like, say you were to go to a clean juice over here in the Providence Town Center and you were to take a picture with you holding your nice juice and you tag clean juice, I know that clean juice will then retag you on their Instagram. And that helps, that helps you because they're sharing it on their Instagram. So you're, you're touching your followers and their followers. So you're getting customer recommendation that's helping you promote your, your product and service. And then we got one more thing and then we're gonna, and then we're gonna head over to question or an example, sorry. So making money, it's, a, it's hard. So it, uh, there's two different like things that you're gonna direct yourself to making money. You either have like product or sales or you're making money based on like ads and stuff and stuff like that on uh, Facebook and stuff. Um, 
but we're going to focus on the we're, we're going to focus on um, ads first. So ads are a great way to make money on social media. So um, you you one pay for ads too, but you also can make money off ads. Um, and so that's paid versus organic. And then so paid is obviously you're paying for your ads. You're paying for Facebook to put your product on the feed when someone scrolls through. If you look on Instagram, every fourth thing that you see on Instagram when you're scrolling is a paid ad and someone paid money to get that on your feed. Now organic is organic following. So Gary V was doing a lot of organic stuff. He was searching and people were fine and he was finding posts organically. Now that's rare. Um, it's a lot harder to get a follower organically. Um, but it is possible. I know Chelsea, you do a lot of paid versus organic stuff. What, what stuff do you have for us? So yes, I would never say like, don't do any organic. Like it's not worth it. Like they go together beautifully, right? Like I'm not going to run paid ads and then people are going to click on the Instagram page it's posting from and see that there's absolutely no posts on the page and it looks like the company is not even active anymore. Right. So they go in hand in hand. I focus on paid, um, in general, uh, you want a return on marketing or so ROM, or you'll hear the word ROAS return on ad spend. You want it to at least be double. So if I put in 20 bucks, I expect that campaign to make at least, did I say 10 or 20? I want it doubled, whatever it is. And you can scale and people spend millions, right? Advertising. Um, but as long as there's a return, people are going to keep pushing their money in. So I focus more on paid just because you can reach, as you know, right? You're being targeted every single day on every app you go to, like paid works to reach people that organic may be a limited uh, reaching, but absolutely they're both important. They both need attention. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Um, one thing with organic that I did wanna talk about that I uh, forgot to mention before I, I sent it over to her. So campaigns. Social media campaigns are a big thing, and you can call them marketing campaigns, but we're talking specifically about social media. Um, I know oftentimes, like, there, there's a big campaign right now going on with McDonald's, and you're seeing it all over uh, social media. I don't have to tell you what it is. You guys know what it is. Um, and they did that, and they're making money. People are, people are going and buying this, this Travis Scott burger, and, and they're making money from it. Um, and it, it's all over social media. So they, they kind of hit all the sectors. Um, they had a sponsor. They had social media presence, and so they kind of just did that. Uh, so campaigns are a big thing. Um, some simple campaigns are honestly just like giveaways. Um, if, you, if you do giveaways where, where people have to like your photo, they have to tag three friends, and they have to like reshare it on their story, like that's easy way. You're getting customer recommendation. You're getting customer retention, and customers are satisfied. Going back to the engaging with your customers. Um, they're a great way to get organic I mean, I guess you're paying a little bit, but it's considered organic. Uh, uh, it's considered organic. So campaigns are a big thing. All right, we're going to go into a quick little practical example um, just to help work things out mentally. Um, so if you guys want to like uh, help us out in the comments or you can turn on your mic and speak and uh, Chelsea, you can help us out too. So go to the next. We're going to be using the Collegeville Diner to help us represent some of these things that we talked about today. So. Um, the first thing that we mentioned was brand development. So we have to answer those three main questions. Um, what is your product? Why do people want it? And yeah, <laughs> what is your product and why do people want it? Those are the two main questions we're going to try to answer now. So if you want to put it in the comment or you can turn on your mic and do it, you can do that as well. We're gonna just wait a little bit. If you guys have any comments, just let us know. If not, I'm gonna work my way through it uh, going here. So we're gonna start off, what is their product? Obviously they sell food. Um, who is their audience? That was the other question I forgot. Who is their audience? So they have many different audiences. We're gonna start with that one. They have college students. We're right around the corner. We're their main audience. But our audience is different than the person that wants family dinner, that brings their family there at six o'clock. 
we show up at two in the morning, their families show up at six o'clock. So how do you create content that caters to both college students and maybe a family? So that's the goal as a content creator. So that takes us to that. So once you have your content that you post on social media, then you have to make sure you have to answer that goal of, of capturing your entire audience. Um, and you can do that through many different ways. So do you have any yeah, ideas so, or anything like that? So he was talking about capturing your audiences through social media and content. Um, right off the top of my head, there's a few things that I think of when, you, when you're talking about a restaurant, um, on social media especially. Um, I know not only the Collegeville Diner, but the Collegeville Italian Bakery has a huge social media presence. Um, and, and kind of the students that are signing us know about their posts and everything that they, that they do on social media. They do a super good job of it. So here's a couple things that I thought of as soon as I heard the word Collegeville Diner. One, posting pictures of people happy in your restaurant, enjoying your food. Okay, that's a great way, especially on Instagram, um, to, to gain followers and also to, um, to create consistent content. The other thing is how-to videos on food, how to make your food, the food at home, right? There's, um, there's great ways in order. Like, so if, I'm trying to think here. So if we're talking about the Collegeville Diner, doing a how-to fit how-to video at, um, on how to make their food. And then the people that are seeing that are going to look, okay, here's how to do it. And then they're going to go back, eat more food, and it's just going to keep spitballing. So Jake. So with creating content, you also need to have engagement within your audience. Um, a great way that uh, a diner or a college of a diner could engage with their um, audience is to, you know, have promotions, have, sales have different types of like say like a, a theme night or a specialty night and you you need to send that out with your content so um you can have like uh, i don't know like a dollar pancake night or something like that um something to get to entice people to come and have food at the diner because um like we said it's college students college students are like that's probably their main draw they're not going to want to pay a bunch of money to go out and eat when they can just eat at Wismer over here and they pay like in their meal swipe. So they have to be enticing. They have to engage with their audience in a sense that they need to appeal to their audience to get them to go to their diner and have food. So a great way is promotions. That's like a big one. All right. Thank you. That honestly wraps up our uh, main presentation. Just a few other quick tips and Chelsea once again can chime in here and help us out. Um, some things that we didn't mention. I mean, we mentioned being active, um, following relevant accounts. That's a big thing. Um, competitive analysis. I'll talk a little bit about competitive analysis. So most products, I mean, I would say all products have a competitor. Look at what your competitors are doing. If they're doing something that's working, I mean, you don't want to copy them, but, but try to do something similar. Um, a lot of times you can learn a lot from what people in your same industry are doing because obviously you're both trying to sell your product. So you, you can learn a lot that way. And then the last thing is hashtags actually are more important than you think they are. Um, it helps for, for searching up content and it really helps with organic content because um, you're not paying for it to be seen. Um, hashtags uh, help it to be seen more, more relevantly. And the more engagement you get with a certain hashtag, hashtag, the higher your post comes up underneath that hashtag. So if you're, if you sell uh, football t-shirts for uh, the Eagles and you use the same, the same hashtag over and over and over again that says go, hashtag go Eagles and people keep liking your content, you're going to show up higher up in the go Eagles hashtag. And it's a great way to get organic, um, the, the gain in organic following based on, based on hashtags. So that, that is all we have the, to lecture you guys tonight. The rest of this time is up to you guys. Um, Chelsea's here. She took time out of her night. So if you have any questions for her, feel free to uh, put them in the chat or, or unmute your mic and you can uh, do so. And then, uh, then we'll wrap things up. So, and then Chelsea, if you have anything else to say, feel free once again to, to blow Yeah, I'd love to hop back to the diner one. You know, I didn't chime in because I really want, you know, some other people to speak up. Um, however, you know, you look immediately at this picture right now. This could be old. We're just using it as an example. I don't know if they're actually under new management, right? But the fact that their sign says under new management suggests that maybe people had a problem with the old management. So I would 
look at this brand and I would say, okay, let's figure out what people did not like, what people were unhappy with. And those are our pain points, right? Of our, um, sorry, I don't know if you can hear my dog squeaking his toy in the background. All right, squeak toy gone. Um, sorry. Uh, so what I would do is, um, pinpoint whatever, say, you know, oh, the forks are dirty or the server took three hours, whatever, whatever it is. And I would say, okay, so we're going to build this into our buyer persona under like some pin, uh, pain points that we have. And then through my marketing, I'm going to highlight those pinpoints. So I'm going to say, um, you know, fastest service in town, blah, 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 get your meal in under 20 minutes. I don't know if they can do that, but I'm going to make a strategic strategy around overcoming all of those objections of why people wouldn't go to this diner. So that's the first thing I thought of. And then of course, with a brand like this, you have a ton of different buying personas, right? So your customers, students, the old folks, families, everyone really. So it's really a great opportunity, right? You have a huge wide range. You just wanna make sure you tailor your marketing accordingly. However, something that immediately stood out. Sorry, I think I was muted. Um, uh, what stood out to me is if I were them, I would do some community outreach. So I would know, okay, the high school, a basketball team comes here after practice. Let's have them spread a promotion out to their whole network and say, you know, if you use the code uh, go, gosh, I haven't been there in so long. I don't even know like what the mascots are, but whatever, whatever the mascot is, uh, you can get 20% off your order. Now they may not always want to do discounts, which is fine, right? Uh, they have to, um, you have to figure out like your return and like how much you can afford to discount to still have your sales worth it, right? But what they can do is use code blah, 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 tell your server and you're going to get a variety platter on us. You're gonna get a large fry on us with your meals. So it doesn't have to be discounts if companies are opposed to that. So, and then I would just go, you know, Greek life, do the same thing and just uh, whatever, uh, senior Saturdays, free, milkshakes with your burger, whatever. So it doesn't have to be giveaways, but if I were them and they have, like a lot of products do a wide range of target audience, I think it'd be a really good idea to say, okay, what matters to these people? Let's customize it a little bit, i.e. maybe a promo code and um, lock it in. So local businesses like this are really fun, right? We're not gonna be marketing to people in New Jersey. It's gonna be very local to College Villain. So you can have a lot of fun, especially if you're familiar with that um, audience already. Hopefully this helps. I just am throwing some creative ideas out there. Yeah, thank you so much. Do we have any questions from the audience? Um, if not, I, I have a few questions here that I, I wrote up for you, Chelsea, that I will ask. But if we have some questions from the audience, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, we can start. We can start with one, and then if you guys want to filter uh, questions through as we go, feel free. And guys, they don't have to be specific questions. You know, go general. We'll we'll work through them. You know. Yeah. So Kelsey or Chelsea, um, I'll I'll ask you this question to get things started. So um, when you are uh, presenting with a new client, I know you do a lot of like independent stuff. So when you're presenting with a new client. How, how do you start the original process of like developing their brand and like what their product is? Um, like what, what are some of your first steps and what, what are some like problems you sometimes like run into with, with the brand itself? So right off the bat, if, uh, and this happens very frequently, right? So, um, a company will say, yes, I want marketing. I know you can do marketing. It's going to be great. We're going to make all this money. The biggest red flag to me, and I will run the other way because I would rather have a client who believes in marketing wholeheartedly. Um, people will say, you want a budget of a hundred dollars a day without any return. Like I can't do that. And you know, sometimes for instance, I had a woman uh, reach out to me very recently. She sold on Etsy, these adorable homemade uh, garland, seasonal garland. She like handmade them. And 
She wasn't liking uh, Etsy regulations, so she wanted to move to Facebook. So I said, great, let's get you started. What happened was she goes, okay, um, I want to warn you that my um, budget for paying me and on Facebook was $200 a month. I was like, huge red flag. Even with $200 on Facebook advertising, you're not going to have, by the time you even test a few things, you're going to be out of your budget. And then there potentially could be no return because you're starting, you're just starting to test and see what performs and what resonates with what, which audiences. So I just gave her some, you know, free advice. She was a really nice lady. And I just said, you know, best of luck. Um, people like that, uh, to me, uh, aren't worth it. Uh, the senior living community I work for, I know I could do wonders for their marketing. I can target. So their target mo uh, market is the adult children, right? So the kids are the parents trying to put them in senior living. And then obviously the seniors themselves, I know I could kill the game on Facebook and advertise for them. However, I also know that the CEO will never front a budget big enough that I need to market. So I won't go down that road. So that's definitely a big red flag that I don't go down. Um, if they say, Oh, well, I can't pay you up front. I need to see results first. I avoid, um, I avoid companies like that as well, just because, um, I don't think it's worth it and it's not really fair. I had a gentleman reach out to me who said, I'm hosting this huge webinar summit. Um, but I can't pay you until we get the sales from the summit. And, and that, keep in mind, remember, I can have the most incredible marketing, get thousands of people through the door, but if their salesperson doesn't convert, I'm not getting paid. So it's, I try to avoid all situations like that right off the bat. But say I do find a client, a really promising client, I know they, they trust the process and they really wanna test and learn and grow. They say, great, we'll work together. Um, the first things I look for are um, their branding. So we talked a little bit about this earlier. If any of you are from the, I don't remember what the group was, the summer group, we talked a lot about this, but basically I say, okay, let me see your brand style guide and let me see your target audience. If they say, oh, I don't know who our target audience is, we immediately need to dive into that and lock that down and break that out. And then uh, their branding. So. If it's a brand new company, you're going to have to develop a new brand, which is really fun. I actually had the privilege of building out, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but Grant Cardone, uh, one of his brands, I had to build from scratch, which was super fun because you have complete control. Um, however, most brands you work with, right, will already have colors in verbiage and yeses and nos. And you can honestly just Google like brand style guide template and you can build out exactly what you're looking for and for instance this company i'm working with now it didn't have one we built it out and now i'm sending it to everyone with we work with so everyone we work with can consistently use the same tone colors verbiage um so all of that is very helpful and then we get more granular but basically kind of feel out the you know it's scary to turn down a client but also you know if they're going to be a nightmare to work with it's not worth your time and then um, from there, making sure that we know their audience and then their branding, and then we can get more granular into the strategy. Awesome. Thank you. Um, that summer program that she was talking about, it was called Digital Spark. I actually was uh, a participant in Digital Spark this summer. It is a great program open to all students and it qualifies your XLP. So it's a summer program. It's an eight week program. You get a $2,500 stipend and you work personally with a small business in this area to help develop their social media and, and raise their awareness on, on any sort of social media platform. So it is a great program. If you're interested, please check out our website for, uh, for more information. So. And then it looks like we do have a question in the chat. Um, are Snapchat stories a good way to build a social media network? Um, I think the short answer is yes, but it also depends on how you utilize it. So Snapchat uh, to me is great, um, but there are a few downfalls with it. Like you, you it's really kind of hard to see links that uh, you might post on your Snapchat story. Um, but it also, the positives, it's a great way to interact with your followers on like a face-to-face -face basis. I mean, obviously you can't see their face, but uh, videos are a great way to, to portray like a personality 
um, and, and have people get to know you. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if Chelsea has anything to add. I don't know if Chelsea uses or does anything with Snapchat at all, but. So, gosh, I'm not really familiar with using stories in particular. I don't think it's a bad idea. I've only seen just based on like the studies I've done, I feel like Snapchat accompanies things like Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, you know, it, it more backs up. And once you have a following, it, it gives you're following more of like an in-person, you know, experience with you live. Um, but it would be kind of interesting to take that direction. Um, I will say I have gone the paid uh, Snapchat route and every time we've ever tried to use Snapchat, it is not cost effective for leads. Now, if you're marketing a product to like 18 year olds, maybe, but, um, you know, as you know, even you get up to like 30, two people aren't using Snapchat anymore. So um, maybe that's why it hasn't been successful for me. Um, however, one amazing thing about Snapchat, I will say if you have the budget to run ads, um, we all have heard, right, Facebook has gotten under a lot of fire. Um, their targeting has been uh, extremely generalized because people were getting really creeped out that you know you can target so specifically. So whereas Facebook, Instagram, um, LinkedIn, everything really generalized their targeting. Snapchat actually is pretty big um, uh, targeting. You can still target by income and things like that. So what I've actually heard uh, people can do is you market on Snapchat not to make a profit, but to data mine. So you can say, you can even export the leads you've created or you've you've brought in and just say, okay, this is my audience. And, and this is actually who's clicking and buying maybe. And then you can carry that over to the more cost effective platforms. But I'm sorry, I can't be more help with the stories, but that's a really interesting idea. Maybe if you post them publicly, I know you could like, you know, post in your area. I forget what it's called. Our story could be worth it. Yeah. I, I, and I'm with you on that one. I don't really know. Um, much about Snapchat stories. Um, like one thing I do know with Snapchat is like geo filters. Um, I, I would say they're, they're honestly less about like the, the points we talked about of like customer intention or retention and, and stuff like that. Uh, but like geo filters, I think you guys probably know what they are when you, you can take a picture and you swipe left and there's a bunch of filters there you can put over your photo, your photos. Um, and if you like the, or sinus college has a geo filter, that says like your sinus college. Um, and so there, those are great ways to like put your, put your brand out there, um, I guess. So I, uh, yeah, I guess it's a way of, of marketing yourself in that way. I can take Mike's question. You I, did, I did that. So, so uh, we had a question if DMing can help you grow. Um, I, so with the U Imagine Center, uh, I run a lot of the Instagram and something that I did that's really unconventional um, and, and isn't something that uh, I, I honestly don't think is efficient, but what I did was I um, shared my posts with my friends, my close friends, um, and told them to just like, look, hey, can you throw this up on your story? So I would take the post that we had for the U Imagine Center, I'd click through and I'd DM um, people and just ask them, can you throw this up on your story for me? Um, and, and I think that's a great way for, if, you're, if you have a smaller following to do it. Um, but uh, as you get bigger, it's not as sustainable, um, obviously, because you don't need it and also, you know, clicking through um, and DMing people um, isn't isn't as sustainable. So I mean, it 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 works in a sense. Um, DMing's D DMs are a great way to just interact with people in general. So if you see someone in your field uh, and they uh, are you're you're looking for a collaboration, things like that. That's how that's how uh, using DMing for for growth really comes into play. So I mean, obviously, it's just messaging. It's pretty simple. Um, if you're looking to collaborate with somebody that even has a bigger following than you to get some recognition, that's, that's a great way to do it. So. And then there's one, how can I use LinkedIn to build a network that will, that will be beneficial in the future? Oh, awesome. I'll start by answering this question and then I'll send it over to Chelsea because I think she knows more. Um, but as Chelsea said earlier, LinkedIn is a great source for networking. Um, specifically, I'll, I'll say networking for Ursinus. So if you have a LinkedIn um, and you, are not connected into your sinus alumni LinkedIn page, I would do that. There is, 
I, I want to say there's like over like close to 5,000 or sinus alum that are on that LinkedIn page. And I, I know it's how me working in the U Imagine Center, I find people like Chelsea who now have high level jobs um, and I help bring them in, help mentor you guys. But it's a great way just to, to meet people. Um, obviously, you're not meeting them in person, but you, you just have that digital presence because uh, they can see you follow them. They can see they view your profile. So that, that's what I have to say. Chelsea, you probably have some more. So I am obsessed with LinkedIn. I'm glad this question was brought up. I think LinkedIn is super powerful. Uh, I would argue it's landed me all of my jobs. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, I uh, made it a habit to try to add like 10 people a day until I got like you know, I wanted the 500 plus connections, relevant, not random people, right? Who I went to high school with, who I went to college with, who's in my field, who's complementary to my field, right? So um, I am extremely active on LinkedIn. And this, this is interesting, right? So uh, we started this presentation talking about posting consistency, right? So I am in this predicament where right now I'm in a bit of a funk. I used to post very regularly on LinkedIn. However, what I don't want to do is just push content to push content, right? You see these people posting thoughtful posts every day. And I'm like, wow, I want, and you know, they have thousands, tens of thousands of likes, comments. And I'm like, wow, I want to be like them, but I don't want to be pushing out fluff. Now, I think it could be a combination, right? Any consistency is important, but I also want people to know what I'm posting. So right now, to be completely honest, I'm in a bit of a funk, right? I want that consistency, I want that engagement, but I also want to give value to people reading my posts. So keeping that in mind is very important. However, don't be afraid. Like most people in my whole LinkedIn network don't post any content. Like, you know, it's scary. It's like, what are you going to post? It has to be business oriented. I don't know. And, um, and it's not the case, right? People will engage no matter what. And, um, one thing is your bio. Uh, my bio, if you go read it, it's, it talks about me catching frogs in a pool and it's a metaphor and it's really bizarre. And of course I'm in marketing, so I have a little leeway with the creativity, right? But I remember for my company, uh, my past company that I worked with those celebrities for, this woman, she was the head of marketing for Overstock. She was going to come in and head up the marketing for my company. And we're in the interview, there's like 20 people and she goes, you know why I wanted to work here? And she was like, I looked at you all on LinkedIn and she's like, I want to work with people like the girl who catches frogs. And I was like, oh my gosh, she's talking about me. But anyway, so um, long story short, uh, LinkedIn is extremely powerful. I would make it your goal to use it actively. My sister's a nurse and she said, no, I don't need LinkedIn. No, I don't need LinkedIn. I'm just going to be placed in a hospital. Great. She was placed in a hospital. Well, now she wants a new job, already quit her job, and she needs a competitive edge over the, you know, bazillion other nurses. So I said, Andrea, let's work on your LinkedIn. Um, one really important part of LinkedIn that I think really helps people find you, let me pull up the exact term, is called the your interests and skills and endorsements so you mine's like online marketing marketing email marketing blah 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 imagine those as your hashtags right that's how people are going to find you and um also you know i was just looking it's really good to put uh get recommendations recommendations make you stand out because a lot of people don't go through the hardship of uh asking for a recommendation for linkedin so before you graduate, I'm assuming most of you are, are still in college, right? So um, ask your professors, ask your advisors, ask anyone, ask whatever colleagues, somebody you did a project with, get those LinkedIn recommendations. They're going to make you really stand out over people who, oh, you know, I'm a recruiter. Oh, these, these resumes kind of look the same. Let me look them up. Okay, good. They both have good headshots, but look, this person has four recommendations, their skill sets, and um, look at all this experience they've built out. So, and they have, I remember my boss who hired me before was like, you are like 30 years younger than me and you have like triple the connections I have on LinkedIn, like I'm impressed. So 
pound LinkedIn, I think it could really be a really strong advantage over other people who are quite frankly, like too lazy to build it out. Yeah, I think that's definitely applicable for us. Um, not all of us are probably seniors, but I know some of the seniors are out there definitely looking for jobs. So the more experience and the more up to date and in depth that you can make your LinkedIn look and professional, uh, the more opportunities that you're going to have um, going forward. Um, I know there's a few questions in the chat, so we're just going to keep going here to chug along. Um, to give you a quick answer to, uh, to Anthony's question here about bad pub publicity. So a few years ago, uh, um, NBA basketball player Zion Williamson uh, was wearing a pair of Nikes. He ripped his pair of Nikes on the court. How does that look for Nike? being that their shoes just ripped on a public stage um, in front of everyone. And they kind of, they flipped it. Um, you really got to just <laughs> go with the flow. They weren't expecting that at all. Um, they, they publicized their company as someone that really represented Zion and they really like wanted to recover from that. Um, so you, you just gotta, you gotta find, you gotta be able to flip the, uh, the bad side of what happens and um, d just showcase your product is worth it. So. And, and a good way to do that. I see a lot of times on social media, um, I don't know. I don't know specifically how Nike handled the Zion situation, but a lot of the times what makes me laugh is if a company like Nike, let's say that happened to Zion and they tweet about it and they make a joke about it. Um, stuff like that is really a great way to say like, look, it's a fluke. Like obviously it doesn't look great in the moment. Um, so that in that way, like bad publicity can turn into good publicity because if you can, you can make a funny tweet about uh, your product malfunctioning or whatever it is, uh, people are going to understand, look, things happen. But uh, if you can really kind of optimize um, that humor in that way, uh, a lot of times when big companies and big like sports teams do that on social media, um, I get, it gets f positive feedback from me, and I'm sure it does from a lot of you as well. Chelsea, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I definitely – I have two thoughts, right? So I think there definitely oh. is – bad publicity. Uh, I don't think even bad, like, I don't think you should seek out bad publicity, even if you're going to overturn it. Uh, I can give you two examples. Uh, so number one, I worked for a, uh, children's, uh, nighttime training diaper, uh, client. They're cute pajamas. And, uh, there's a YouTube video. Somebody left a like 20 minute long review, uh, ripping apart literally, uh, this brand. So it's really bad, right? Because we'll be on YouTube and we're trying to promote our videos, but the recommended videos, it always comes up, right? So it's basically fighting all of our, uh, efforts on YouTube. And so to overturn that, right, we can obviously comment and, uh, address it even via, via like video back. That is definitely hurting us though. Cause she ranks really high. Um, Another case in which um, it could be good and you can show we are a company of real people and we care and um, our customers are our number one priority. So for two companies that I've worked with, they've, uh, the pajamas company, it either, you either love it or you hate it. So we have a ton of negative comments on our ads. So they say, you know, oh my God, my son peed right through this night one. We reach out, we say uh, publicly, you know, if it's really bad, we hide it or delete it, fine. But if it's bad and we can overturn it, we address it. We say, wow, we are so upset that you had this terrible experience. Like DM me your number and we will call you today. Other people are going to see that. Like if we say we're going to make this right, it means a lot, right? It could actually help you in the long run. Other people will be like, wow, this is a local company, they're answering me. So really, I think you can salvage it, but I would definitely say like, don't go seeking even negative publicity. You're gonna be working your butt off to try to cover it up. We've had um, a different company, uh, had some really bad articles and we could go down this rabbit hole, but they were basically trying to fight the, uh, out the like um, publication companies to push them down on Google ranking. They were trying to outrank them on Google. It gets really expensive and it's a science. And so, yeah, you definitely don't want, I would say you don't want bad publicity unless you know you can like easily overturn it. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're running out of time. Yeah, there is. Um, 
you guys are free to leave whenever you want, but if you want to stick around and have your question answered, you're more than welcome to. Chelsea, do you work with uh, YouTube a lot? Uh, mm, minimally, but you know, you can look, uh, I can probably send an example. There's some really simple things you can post in the body. So you just have to be mindful of using your keywords in the title, in the just in like in the description body. Um, and a way to quickly do that really, really quick crash, cor crash course is like pick your topic, whatever you want to post about and start typing in the search bar. You know how like it will give suggested posts. That's your examples of what people are searching, right? So you can also, if YouTube isn't enough, you know, if you have a market that may be on Pinterest, start typing in Pinterest. That way you can get your topics. You can see what people are searching. So you know, you're going to come up on their feed, right? So that's a good topic generating method. And then once you have your keywords, say like how to shoot a basketball. Okay. Well then we're obviously going to want to put that in the description and then you're going to want to incorporate it into the body. You want to backlink always to your website or whatever social media platforms you're trying to advertise because if there's no call to action, then why are you having your video, right? So after a while, I think you have to have like X amount of following or watch views or whatever on your account, but you can start overlaying buttons onto your YouTube account that backlink to whatever you want, your website, your social media, whatever. So, but I would definitely recommend doing your keyword research, see what people want. So if you, you know, you have an idea, oh, I want to, I want to post my cat. Okay. Um, let's start seeing what cat topics people are interested in. Um, Google, you could also use Google um, Keyword Planner. I don't know if anyone has ever used that, but that's a really good way to check search volume. And as you know, Google owns YouTube. So they're, um, they're really uh, closely integrated. Hope that helps. That was really quick, I know. Yeah, no, that was, that was really good. Um, and just to reiterate a few things that she said, uh, just in general, not specifically to YouTube. I think like, Honestly, the biggest thing, like, in order to grow a, a social media following in a, in a general sense, I, I think that your best sense is to like diversify. So it's, it, might be start, it might be hard to start out um, gaining a YouTube following, but if you have a little bit of a following on Instagram, maybe, maybe see if you can transition some of those Instagram followers over to, over to Instagram, promote or over to YouTube, promote your YouTube videos on your Instagram, um, use the followers that already engage with your content and, and have them engage with other content that they also may like. Um, definitely, uh, definitely a way to uh, increase your, your following in that, in that sense as well. And on, on YouTube, I know that um, the algorithm can be some, kind of confusing sometimes based on like what gets seen, what doesn't get seen, um, what pops up in your, in your timeline. Um, so the thing is with YouTube, it, it's, it's kind of difficult in that sense, but if you really pay attention to, to what the algorithm is right now, um, it's a lot of like fast paced content. Um, the long form isn't really doing super well right now on YouTube, uh, but the podcast space is doing well. So it's kind of confusing um, in, in that aspect, but I think if you can really just stay in tune with, and this goes for any platform, if you can stay in tune with what the trends are, and that kind of goes back to um, the, the, what I was talking about and what Gary Vee was talking about was interacting with people. If you, can kind of, if you can kind of stay on top of what's going on in whatever platform that you're using, um, you can really use that to your advantage and, and have your posts be seen if you're, if you're kind of going with that algorithm. We want to engage you guys by having you follow our social media. So if you want to take out your phone, you can scan that QR code that is on your screen right now. And uh, it takes you to all our social medias. So thank you, Chelsea, once again, for coming in. Thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you guys learned something. Um, I hope you guys have a good night. And uh, yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you guys.